Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. We're back again, Aloha Friday, with the Millennial Entrepreneur. My name is Lindsay K. Wilburn, and I'm here with Sergio Garzon, a good friend and amazing artist who works out of the Chinatown Artist Lofts. I first met Sergio when I was writing an interview for Abstract Magazine, the incubator and publication that comes out of Han Blue Design Studios. He amazed me with the quality and passion in his artwork, and as I got to know him better and attended his Print Bigger series, I realized what a truly ingenious entrepreneur artist he was. I'm honored to have you here on the show today, Sergio, and to learn more about what it takes for an artist to be an entrepreneur in this world of you know, declining uh, economies and you know, difficulties with jobs. But you are persisting, and you have followed your passion and become successful. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you for having me. Your fabulous shows. It's amazing. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, I'll be willing to share anything, and anything that I can share with everyone will be great. Yeah, so we're going to get the top secret scoop on this local icon here. So, Sergio, um, there's always a moment when you decide, well, okay, so I'm going to pursue my art or, uh, you know, get a day job. There's like kind of a point where you have to make that decision. What was that point for you? Where were you at, and how old were you? It's hard to say well, there's one way how it presents itself to a person, right? It's not like I can say there's one formula for it all. It happens to us all differently. For me, it was stuck in the same job with dreams and wanting to be free from that and wanting to work for myself and and, and it, was, it was poetic, and I was staring out the window, and I, and I saw a couple walking a dog, and, this, and it, that did it. And I went crazy after that and just did everything I could to uh, get out of the job and go to school or find you know, scholarships or anything, you know? So how old were you? Like I, when, when I you... guess I was like somewhere between 21 and 23. And were you in Hawaii? And I was in Atlanta, or? Georgia, yeah. Atlanta, Georgia. At a place I worked at for 10 years called the Fish Market. What is What was the Fish Market? Uh, it, was, it was just like a five-star restaurant, like uh, pulled right out of the 60s with, you know, original costumes and everything for the waiters and giant murals. And you see, it was a fantastic place. Fresh fish was served there and cooked. Uh, on the spot, it was beautiful. Everything was like one of the best places I ever got to learn a little bit about uh, fine dining and cuisine. Uh, yeah, so the fish market was that, and, and, and I worked there. What were you? So you were um, you were doing art your entire life, I assume, right? You've always been creating things. <laughs> Is that right? Yes. And but what mediums were you working in, and what, what what kind of stuff were you doing while you were still working at that full time? restaurant job. I remember you told me you were working with uh, ships in a bottle. So the trick is to, while well, if you do have to be working, that you have something cooking, something you're doing, something that you're, you're still exploring your ideas, you're still daydreaming about it, whether you want to tell anyone about it or not, right? But you gotta have some something happening. You either gotta have a sketchbook, or you gotta have something small you can just work with, uh, doodle, because uh, that way eventually, uh, you know. The, I think that's when the change happens. When you have this thing that just overtakes your your life, and and then you can't say no. So the transition is not is not really up to you. Uh, it just happens, mm -hmm. and. Yeah, and it's not a, it's not by luck either. It, it it happens because you have these small things happening in the background. That yeah. So what were you doing? What were your I, small things? I was doing a lot of things. I was painting uh, mural size paintings, very kind of spacey and all about knowledge and all, a lot of uh, spray paint was used mixed in with a traditional art supplies and so I found my own way to kind of express myself with with the medium of spray paint and that was really fun and 
I got to keep a lot of them and, and save them, and I was doing that, and I was also just exploring any kind of little thing, everything from sand castles to ships and bottles and uh, juggling and unicycling and you name it. I was just trying to stay busy and at the same time having marathon ships at the restaurant, right? So eventually one of them overtakes the other one. And, uh, but you know, yeah. I, you, I remember you told me at this moment, this um, transition moment that you had, where uh, the your boss at the restaurant really sort of believed in you and actually bought one of your ships in the bottle. Yeah. And so that was a. It sounded like that was you know the moment when any entrepreneur is working for what they believe in, and then finally they are able to um, sort of like expand that and other people really believe in them and recognize what they're doing yeah. is valuable when you kind of like show it to the world and then realize that you are accepted and loved in fact so what was that moment like so tell, tell us that story um, where you got your ship you gave the ship in the bottle to your boss at the restaurant and, and, and during this and during this time it was something I learned that went even beyond the moment it's something that I took forever with me and that what you just said that it is the return of the people that you, they believe in you as you're making it through your career, you know, who are belling you out, who are buying your artwork, who are cheering you on, who are there for you when you need somebody or when you're really low. And then to be able to repay them back by A, being, you know, making it a successful career or you know, following your dreams or being happy or anything that just makes them feel proud. There's no better return. And that's kind of like what happened with uh, Chef Bobby and where like a real five-star restaurant in New York uh, stuck up, uh, you know, hardcore cutthroat a chef, head chef, you know, and uh, he fired you on the spot if you, you looked at him the wrong way. And it was uh, amazing that I kind of got into him and got to know him through my ships and bottles and he learned that I because he they don't care. How did you he know are. you were making you know, the ships and bottles? I, I was I actually met a client at the restaurant, you know. So I was like, let's meet there, it's fancy. And he, he would buy them, you know, he, I was selling them. And while I was waiting for the man, I, Chef Bobby saw it, asked me what it was. He's never seen anything like that in his life. He freaked out. Uh, then he asked me to come talk to him later, and yeah, he said that he wanted one. And so, yeah, he didn't ask me, he, he said I, he wanted one, and so I made him one. And then one turned into a dozen. Uh, one of the best things about this story is that I would never really understood if he really liked the boats. Uh, if, you can't tell with him that he has no emotions, seems that way, when he's at work. and so. One day he surprised me by asking me to go have dinner with him and his girlfriend. And to my surprise, he had all the ships made a mahogany um, furniture piece with glass and spotlights uh, for all the boats. And they were just looked like a million bucks. Uh, and I was just pretty stoked that he, he did that and he honored them. Uh, and when I got to go to school and I found my dream, he was he was really happy that I was quitting and that I was getting out of that, you know? Yeah, so, so he was your first collector in a way. Yeah, in a sense. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. <laughs> yes, yes, the chef. The chef, chef. Bobby. At the fish market, and that yeah. is now the name of your studio, yeah, right? Yeah, that stuck with me forever from the ones that I made in Atlanta and uh, Syracuse and, and now here, yeah, it's like, I, uh, I stuck with me, fish market. I Sergio like Garzon at the fish market. Yeah, I like fish market. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Yeah, that's such an interesting story. And so after you yeah. kind of were able to see, you know, this value, like, I don't know, get that sort of rush where, you know, somebody's believing you. Sort of, it's almost like in Super Mario Brothers when you get that, like, one up and suddenly you kind of are able to, you know, go on to the next level. Um, what was the next level for you? So you were, you said you were going to school, um, and you were going to art school, I assume? Yes. The next level was to be able to see that, um, that if you have the, the, 
drive and the, just the sheer passion to move forward, sheer determination that you, everything is waiting for you, everything is there for you to take advantage of. Everything from money to any kind of support, financial support or moral support, spiritual support. It's, it's quite a fantastic like declaration. Uh, and going to school was that, that uh, made me believe that, wow, I just found a way and where there was no way uh, because there was so much determination behind it and it just it came upon me like right. that. So, And that's a, that's a hallmark moment for entrepreneurs, I believe, where you are pursuing, you're persevering through different struggles and it seems like mm -hmm. Things might not let up. It seems hard, and it seems like you know nobody. You're working on your all of your little projects, um, but you haven't really, you know, got to that point where uh, it's like you've broken through a point. And then, like once you've broken through that point and sort of, you know, I guess got. I almost want to. Yeah, I guess it, it is sort of like the next level in a video game. You know, once you've like really kind of moved on, it just it feels like it exponentially just continues to build. If you, if what you're doing, you know, is working out, and and that's sort of the moment for the entrepreneur, it can kind of go two ways. It can either be, well, no, and you tank, and then you reorganize and figure something else out to do, or, you know, you really just take it and run. So, um, so you're you're taking it and running. You're going to art school. You got a scholarship, and um, what kind of stuff were you studying there? Um, you know, I was like a kid in a candy store and. The school I went to was really amazing. There was a broad range of things that you could take. Uh, you didn't have to declare majors per se, like painting or printmaking or you know, photography. You could just be uh, all around fine artists and take whatever classes you wanted to take as long as you passed them and you know did all that stuff. And it was really awesome going to school. I took full advantage of it. A, a, some other declarations while I was going to school was also I realized that when you enter an institution, when you sign yourself up to something and you 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 agree to pay somebody for uh, for, for for a trade or, or or whatever you know, they you have the right to to if need be demand the things that you need in order to set yourself up for success. You're paying an institution to provide you with the means to move forward in your career. Not not if, but they must. And I learned that in school, what, I was just going down to the studios and this student just stopped, and a much older student just stopped me and said that, and he says, hey man, remember, they work for you. And it just kinda clicked in, and ever since then I, w I was able to enter an institution and um, not say abuse it but you almost like want to exploit it to a point where it's like uh, you know sit correct that is you know within moral values right that you want to enter any kind of opportunity and and just extract every possible source and resource that it that is there for you Mm -hmm. They really are. It's, it's like it's an really, incubation yeah. period. Almost. It just looks yeah. strange for someone to go, you know, to go all out and and take advantage of everything. You know, it seems almost like gluttony. But uh, when you're pursuing knowledge, education, and an adventure, you can, I think gluttony is a great thing. Right. I mean, yeah. sometimes you see students yeah. nowadays, yeah. and they, um, you know, out. well, they um, almost do. The, well, yeah, they they would freak out maybe at that, but. Um, it seems like from my experience uh, during undergraduate, when I went to um, small liberal arts school, um, I also took some classes at the University of Hawaii <laughs> and all that kind of thing. And it was, you know, it seemed like the students were really expecting um, the teachers to guide them and sort of like hand feed them mm, different, right. you know, little nuggets or like tell them sort of, you know, really guide them. But then uh, I think it's really on the student. The student is paying the money um, they need to figure out what works for them and be agile enough yeah. to, to realize that, and that's how you get the full value from the money. Exactly. To and be it, able to ask for it, you'll get more. 
especially if it's your money uh -huh. that you're spending, not like your parents' money or the government's money or um, something like that. If it's really like what something that you've earned yourself, mm. that uh, I think is driven home pretty deep because if you're paying all this money and yeah. you've worked so hard to do that, then you're not just gonna sit around and you know wait for somebody right. to tell you what to do. You're like on it. <laughs> right, paying yeah. for a service. I know, you're paying for a service. Yeah, so we're gonna take a little break. Um, we're here with Sergio Garzon of The Fish Market, a studio that he runs in the Chinatown Artist Lofts. He's also the man behind Print Bigger a uh, wonderful series of um, huge woodblock printing on the street with a steamroller. Uh, the last one was at um, the Kakaako Night Market recently. And we'll be coming back in a little bit to talk about his different projects here in Honolulu. Aloha, thank you for tuning in. Aloha, I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone number no. nine has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. Aloha, Hello. and welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Lindsay K. Wilbur of the Millennial Entrepreneur, and we're broadcasting straight to you from Pioneer Plaza on this slightly rainy Honolulu afternoon. And we're here in the studio with legendary artist Sergio Garzon. And I say legendary because it is legends which he loves to paint and uh, to express. And so, in addition to his legendary, uh, you know, reputation in the community, of course. But uh, he, he does a lot of different projects, and we were just discussing, um, you know, the journey of any kind of young entrepreneur, anybody who really has um, a dream, where they have this dream, they nurture this dream, somebody believes in them, they are encouraged and prepared to take the next step, and that's what he did. He was working at a five-star restaurant, took the dive, became an artist. He went to, started going to art school, and now he is a professional um, working artist, um, doing amazing stuff. So let's talk a little bit about what you're up to in Hawaii now. So you have several different projects going on. Um, do you want to just uh, describe a few of them? Sure. Um, gosh, Hawaii is such a great place for art. It really is. Um, tons of opportunity, tons of areas of art that have not been uh, explored, um, very little competition, and, and it's just a great land for inspiration, and, and you just can't top it, right? And so... The natural beauty. Exactly. Right. And, and the history, too. No doubt. And when I first got here, I, I, was, I was wondering what a kind of artwork I was going to start making, and then... Uh, I remember being out at the surf, uh, waiting for a wave, and on the, on the right side, I saw this wave break out, and, and the rainbow got caught on the, on the spray, and it was just like this wave running in the middle of the ocean with this rainbow behind it, and I felt defeated, and, and almost I felt that it would be an insult to try to uh, keep painting landscapes or, or keep doing uh, rambling is what it's called like you know, landscape paintings and that kind of thing and so I really uh, I, I brought some icons that I had started chasing back in Atlanta um, and it had something to do with where I'm from as a native Indian and we uh, did a lot of fishing and there was this particular fish that it took the whole community to really to bring these monsters down um, and uh, a lot of people have seen it on the monster TV show with fish you know the guy who goes out and catches huge monsters what's it called? Uh, it's called an Arapaima and they're about you know they're gigantic you know 12 feet maybe even bigger and they're very uh, difficult to kill and so we have to drown them Anyways, it's a whole community thing, and it was, it was feeding us back then, and I felt like I should bring it into the now, 
and and help it feed me. And so I created a, a few fish, um, brand woodblock brands, smaller in size. And then there was this particular event when we needed to do something spectacle, and I had already experienced carving. Uh, eight foot by four foot woodblock pieces, that, which is the average wall size. Is usually what you see. The, your walls of your house are eight foot by four foot planks of wood that are lined up, and so you use that, and um, it's easy to get to and it's cheap. And so I was like, I'll make a big giant anapaima, an eight footer, and we'll carve it out, and let's see what happens. And we did that, and it was a great success, and, and people really flipped out about the size. And I noticed that there was a huge demand for large wood blocks, and I said to myself, well, I remember using and reading a steam, that a steamroller could be used to, you know, do things. And that's kind of like how, a little bit of how Print Big started. The idea kind of started with the uh, large Arapaima that, that I brought from you know my native country, but then I. Where is your native country? Colombia. Colombia. Uh, yeah. And and was this part of Honolulu Printmakers? Yes, yeah, exactly. And so it was the Honolulu Printmakers that put the show together, and I was really stoked that. But if for at some point or another, you listen to where you are, and you you li listen and and follow, and I started to bring in a lot of different things into my narrative of, of art because uh, it expands anything from the sketchbooks to paintings, right? Or it could be sculptures or it could be, I don't know, it could be a performance or even a guitar song. Uh, but yeah, Hawaii definitely started bringing me into the the myth of the land is my favorite thing here. It's so mythical. In the last print bigger, you did it at Kakaako Night Market. And yeah. what was it that you created? What, what so it's it? a series of prints that I'm trying to accomplish by 2016, uh, and they're the, the the gods of the Polynesian gods that you know used to rule the islands. They're, they're still you know around in some sense, right? And and they're just charming, colorful characters. And I've gotten myself my hands on some literature, and I read about them, and they were just so fantastic that I wanted to um, just have an itch to you know, create them, to manifest their, their, their looks in my own interpretation. So the first one, I'm still on the first one. <laughs> so it's Kanaloa, and Kanaloa is the god of the ocean. And uh, he's a pretty mean dude. And he has three different forms in where he can morph. And so he can be... Uh, a big whale, right? Uh, or he can be a squid, or he can be a porpoise. So um, we did the first form of Kanaloa, the whale, uh, a 300 square foot woodblock print at the Honolulu Museum. And that was his first form, the whale. And then the second form was the squid. And that one was 740 square feet, 63 feet long. And that happened at the night market in Kakaako. And that was a lot, a lot of fun. Uh, I think that people receive them really well because they're connected. And they're very interactive, too. So, you know, you see this thing yeah. happening in the street where there is a yeah. steamroller and, like, tons of people all around. and. You know, it's just like a, it's a really big space, and then you, everybody gets to help. So every, you know, once everything's set up, you get to go in there and, you know, take these um, kind of like, what is it, cheese, not cheesecloths, um, what kind of cloth is it that you use for printing? Um, so the way that we make wood blocks traditionally is you take a piece of wood and you carve out an image, sort of a stamp. Then you take your stamp and you apply ink on the very surface of the wood block, on the flat side, right? So wherever there's a hole, wherever there's a cutting, it means that no ink has gotten into that area. And that's the white area. 
So it's kind of like when you're carving a wood block, you're doing it backwards. You're creating a negative. So once you have ink on this stamp, you put it on your uh, machine and you put a piece of paper on top of it and you apply anywhere between 100 to 200 pounds per square inch on wood. Mm -hmm. So all of us, you know, there's maybe about maybe like 40 people who were holding on to the, the piece of paper, lowering it onto the inked uh, wood block and, you know, watching this happen, sort of like seeing it all unfold, which I think is really perfect. You know, so much times, uh, so many times art happens, you know, in studios or like the artist is alone. And I mean, for a lot of it, you know, the carving, of course, you were alone, but then to share it with the community and to really um, bring everybody together and, you know, allow us to feel like we've been a part of this legend and a part of this story is really powerful, I think. I love that part of the story, and that's the most inspiring part of that is happening in my career right now is that I believe a lot of artists try to get out of the whole egomaniac ego phase. And where we, we, you don't want to be, it's not about the ego, it's not about you, it's about really creating work that is moving. Uh, it's not necessarily thought of for sale, but it, it says something and, and it's an entity of its own. And, it really trying to get out of that e ego maniac part of, of just being an artist and finding a way and where what you do can also work with others and they can collaborate to make it happen or they can interact in some way or another. They can take a little bit home and feel proud and talk about it during dinner and have all these influences on hundreds of thousands of people really. That to me is my favorite part of working large, and of course, I, you know, you need people to print something big like that. And when I showed up to Kakako, I only had six people in my team, and and three of them bail out, bailed out, and so I didn't know how I was going to do it. But when I started uh, asking for people to you know come out and and help, this started happening, and everyone just kind of. They understood what was about to happen, and they appropriated their moment and their job very seriously, and they did it flawlessly. And they took photographs, and it's just, if that, to me, it was quite a reward. I, I didn't care if it was going to come out or not. Just seeing all those people work together to put that big, giant piece of paper down. Was, and that, I think, is one of the best parts. And the part that artists should really try to aim at is how do I contribute my artwork to the whole as a whole? Like, what does my artwork do for the whole as an entirety, not as in just for me? Absolutely. And where can people find this uh, print now? Well, where can they come see it? So it's right now in the process of being shown in many different places. It, it's kind of on the, on the low, uh, but it's definitely going to go. I'll give you some hints. One of them is going to go into Kailu Elementary School and children are going to help me. We paste it and we're going to have fun with it and maybe possibly paint it on this big giant wall that they have and they're going to love it. Uh, the other one is uh, we're, uh, we're thinking about having a display at Mark's Garage building by wrapping the entirety of the outside wall of the building which measures uh, close to 100 feet and that will be a really fun event. Uh, we're trying to think of a colossal art show and that's for March. Excellent, um, yeah. excellent. Well, we're going to take a quick break and then hear more about where you can find Sergio's art and what's next for him. So, aloha, thank you, and we'll see you in a little bit. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting live from the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. We raise public awareness about tech, energy, and globalism in Hawaii. Technology is critical to our state. A vibrant tech sector will give us new prospects in the global marketplace and will offer great careers and make our economy more resilient. Streaming live on Ustream and Spreaker, ThinkTech allows its hosts and guests invaluable opportunities to report important events and discuss important questions and to be heard here in Hawaii and around the world. You can find links to our live streams on thinktechhawaii.com or on our mobile website m.thinktechhawaii.com. And you can see our archive on YouTube. It's all just a click away. 
We want to do whatever we can to keep Hawaii relevant, connected, and thriving in the complexity of the 21st century. We hope you will help us in those efforts. Tune in today. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo. Aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Lindsay K. Wilbur. You're watching The Millennial Entrepreneur. And we're talking to Sergio Garza, a local artist and an art entrepreneur in his own right. The man behind Print Bigger, the woodblock extraordinaire, bringing back this ancient art to the modern day and translating ancient Hawaiian myths into a modern uh, retelling that involves interactive art and a steamroller. Can you imagine, right? <laughs> so we have some really cool, uh, well, we have actually the print here. Do you want to show us? Some of this? Yeah, this, uh, we, so we have the whale here. Yeah, we have the whale. Yeah, so. Kauna Loa in his whale form. So, the whale is, you know, just to get an idea mm, of what big. something this size <laughs> is like, uh, you know, you get kind of a feeling for. We're going to have a little, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. And it, it is, it is, what you got to remember is that all, this is made out of one giant piece of wood, right? This is one giant piece of wood, ladies and gentlemen. Can you believe it? And, you know, and this was pressed, and it's so big that it doesn't fit in here. Because it it's a whale, even fit. Obviously. The Think Tech studios are now overrun by whales, so if you can yeah, so <laughs> imagine. We got an idea. <laughs> Oh, this this uh, is truly extraordinary, actually. Okay, where 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 did you go? Oh, there, there we are, there we are. Um, so this is gonna go in Kailua Elementary. Not this one. Not this this, this one. is only one third of the size of the squid. One it, it's, third. Yeah, of it, it is. It's, it's scary. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, when they say, when you see giant squids on the television, on, you know, Nature Channel, you're like, oh, that's nice, that's nice, oh, it'd be cool to see one of those. But then something like this, you realize, I don't really want to run into one of these guys in the wild, you know, these things are pretty damn big. <laughs> they are fantastic creatures, and really, um, when you look at these images of the animals, embedded in them, there is this hidden message. Uh, I have been working on this technique of hiding things within things, almost like a magic eye. You think those games and where you have to cross your eyes and, and look at it a certain way and then you see something there that you didn't see before and, and that that you see is sometimes, often, is some comment on, on my views, on culture, myth, uh, social dynamics, anything. And so um, there is, it's subtle because you have to really be looking for, for answers. It doesn't to see reveal them. itself upon mm -hmm. first glance. You know, just looking at it, you begin to see the intricacies that are hidden within it. That's actually one of my favorite parts about your art. And, you know, I've been to his studio many First Fridays and hearing a lot of the reactions, and you just get people like picking up some of his smaller prints and looking at it for like, half an hour and trying to figure out all the little things that are hidden within it. Um, I, I especially loved, um, there was in his latest one, the giant squid, there was this really cool derailed um, train. And then uh, also like Aloha Tower as well. And sort of like all these things that you can just, that I don't know, I didn't even notice it. I think it was like maybe like the third or fourth time that mm. I looked at it that like those things really kind of came out to me. Yes. Um, it was so cool. And so, okay, so, Back to this. So this one's not going to go in Kailua Elementary. No, the squid is the one that we're negotiating and having them be an interactive event for the kids. And, and so this is again about how your work is going to uh, interact with the whole of the community. And, and and people are watching, and they and they and they know that you're trying to do something. And yes. especially yeah. with, right, and especially with the budget cuts going on with a lot of schools and, you know, when budget cuts happen, usually art education is one of the first things to go. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what I've been hearing, you know, from a lot of uh, the powwow people, too, who do the powwow art school, art and music school, and that's sort of their intention as well, is to bring art to the kids. And so is this going to be the first time that you're working with kids in through art education or have no, you worked with kids before? I have. Um, we have done a couple of projects. We had posted, me and my team had put up a 
printing at um, Young Street and Victoria Street, the intersection right before Thomas Square, is a 260 foot long wall that was commissioned by Long's uh, Drugstore. And we used the whale, we printed many whales, and we covered this, this entirety of the wall with this technique by using wheat paste, which is A, uh, a lot safer and better on the environment and yourself, and B, is not as destructive as the per se, the spray paint. Against, spray paint or spray glue as well too, that kind of thing? That kind of thing. And so, uh, yeah, it's kind of the, how everything originated. And uh, I included some children to come in and because there was graffiti and vandalism happened to the wall, but it was easy to just reprint a wood block on paper and involve the kids to do that. And what was then, their reaction? Like, what do they think about it? Was, it? They never seen anything like that, but they quickly caught up to it. It's just how you speak to the kids, how you interact with them, you know? Uh, they're just beautiful creatures and they want art and they want to be creative and, you know, and they want to get messy. And so they loved it. And that was a good interaction. And I feel like we pasting is something that kids can do that is not doesn't require like just e le easy to learn and the result it's sort of collaging yeah. it's collaging and on the, a larger scale yeah. and the really like the the, tr the thing here the crux of, of the entirety is that they look at what they have done with their classmates and it's something gigantic and colossal and let's see we think of us like at our height but I've been thinking as a child much shorter to see a giant squid of that size, it's even more impressive. And so, and to know that they did it, they yeah. put it up there. Yeah. yeah. So when they drive, even if I think they if they drive with their parents down Young Street, they point out and they say, "Yeah, I helped with that. Yeah, I did that. I in my class with this Mr. S. That's what they call me." Mr. S. Mr. S. Mr. S. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. It sounds like a Bond villain. No, or <laughs> it's great. And so this is not, well, you've been recently uh, doing more teaching and working mm. um, with students, uh, teaching them how to sketch. Um, you have mm. a class, you had a sold out class at the Honolulu Museum of Art School mm. um, recently. And our, what was that like? Um, what, you know, what? was the process for you going from, you know, artist working in a studio, doing shows, to sharing your knowledge um, that you've accrued? Hmm. The Honolulu Museum Art School was one of the greatest influences in my career here in Hawaii. Without their support and their help, it, it would have been very difficult to get to where, to where I was needed to get. And they have offered me an opportunity to teach a class there. And I really wanted, I thought about it really hard. I maybe wanted to teach something with large wood blocks or something like that. But instead, I started to think a little bit about my own dogma of, of art and, and how is art being, you know, where, where are the artists right now? How are they feeling about with their aptitude and everything? We're going to take a quick break right now, but when we return, we're going to hear about Sergio's philosophy of art and philosophy of art education. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So my name is Lindsay K. Wilbur. We're here with Sergio Garzon in the Think Tech Studios here in the heart of downtown Honolulu. So please like us on Facebook, and we'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone Number 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. Aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii. In the heart of downtown Honolulu, this slightly rainy Aloha Friday afternoon. And we're here in the studio with artist Sergio Garzon. You can catch him in his studio every first Friday in the Ch downtown Chinatown artist lofts at his fish market studio. And also, you can catch him at Mark's Garage and the Honolulu Museum of Art School, where he's teaching a class 
And we were just about to hear his philosophy of art and his philosophy of education and how he teaches young artists to do amazing sketches of what they see around them. So um, what is this philosophy you speak of? My philosophy. It's a, it's a pedagogy, maybe I like to call it. And, 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 and it's been evolving the more I, I, I look and the more I study and the more I read about how things are happening right now. And I ask artists, you know, how do you feel right now about where you are with your career? How does it feel to be an artist? I ask another artist. You know, the answers are disturbing. And um, that's because... What are some of the answers? Uh, well... Like the most disturbing one, I guess, that you've heard. Uh, professional suicide. Mm. You know, that's something like that that really got me thinking. And this is, this is everyone knows about this uh, kind of like a dark cloud that, that surrounds our career. Uh, if it's not applied arts, then it's being looked down as really a, a we're not really sure what the outcome may be, so you better have something to fall back on. And... Mm, right, the starving artist. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I believe that there's basic principles in art school that could be um, really brought up to light, even to the spotlight, and really push forward into students so that when they come out of universities and art schools, they'd have the tools necessary to make hard cold cash and it's pretty easy the only one tool that you need to be able to survive in the art world is the ability to draw if you can draw you're going to be able to make some kind of income you're going to be able to be creative in some sort of way you'll be able to express yourself and your ideas a lot more articulately by manifesting them on a napkin than speaking about them or paying someone else to draw them. This is a tool that when you have nothing else, if you have a pen and a paper, something can happen. And it's uh, quite rare. Even now, if you think, you go outside with your sketchbook and you draw in the middle of, the, even like let's say the finance, financial district here in downtown Honolulu. And I stop down there and I start drawing on lookers everywhere. They stop. It's something that people don't do anymore. They they used to. Well, I I lived in Paris for a couple of years, and people, thankfully, still do this. In Thank Paris. God. Yeah. Thank God. But it's it's really looked as something strange, and this is um, whether you're an artist or not. But I'm really going for like the dogma and the pedagogy of to say that drawing techniques and and the aptitude, really the hardcore aptitude, the uh, eye hand coordination. That's all. That's all. That's as far as I want to go. The hand-eye coordination of students when they leave universities right now is pitiful. And therefore, they cannot draw, they cannot express themselves, they cannot paint. All they can do is try to express themselves in some random way. Mm. And it, yes, there's the oddity, and there's the one individual, I mean, a handful of them there, just through sheer valor and, and, and passion, they make their way through a school that doesn't give them the tools that they need. They find their way, you know, and those are beautiful things. Uh, but 90% of the students that are going there looking for a skill are living with, with nothing. Hmm. Yeah. All right, that does seem like a foundation. I mean, we've worked together on a project in the past where, you know, I hired Sergio to draw for me mm -hmm. and actually is one of the most, it was amazing and you did a great job, but for me as a writer, I'm a writer storyteller, um, I had these visions and mm -hmm. that's something that I actually personally um, have been working on myself and I'm really looking forward to taking your next class actually. Thank you. <laughs> because um, you are an amazing sketcher. Uh, like you, I love flipping through your books. Mm, um, thank you. So, talk, tell us more about about your process. Um, this. So, the process of sketching, drawing that is, has a lot to do with your memory, and so the class that I'm going to be teaching has uh, is is really a different style of teaching, uh, art, and involves many practical exercises, somewhat laborious, 
and uh, for one hour and 85 minutes we're going to do these exercises back to back to literally like an athlete get your body warmed up um, before I, we can, I can even ask you to, to do anything in your sketchbook you have to be ready to go and I have you for four hours so 85 minutes I think that I can afford and you know one of the things that seeing my class once a week is not enough but I will make sure that they understand that if if one is to practice these exercises once a day it would be fantastic you could you could evolve your way of seeing things you can be more quickly and witty and uh, it's, it's a fantastic way of uh, igniting your mind to, to, to be alert. And, and you, you told me, so um, yeah. in terms of like when, you, when you're sketching, so like perception is obviously, perception of your environment is key and essential mm. to sketching it, obviously. Um, so you work, do you work with how, um, what to see, what to perceive, like what kind of, I don't know, you, you said to me before that the perception yes. is essential. Perception is essential. Um, maybe even the uh, word cropping comes to mind, and where when we are ready to capture a, a moment in in this world, in this movie called life, we need to understand the laws of cropping and which areas you're going to be showing. And that's one of the very uh, strong part of drawing. That way, if you're going to draw something, you need to really uh, tell yourself where the lines and where the actual site fo is focused on and exercises that uh, seem mundane some things like uh, blind contouring and where you draw without looking at the piece of paper you know you're drawing blind in a sense mm -hmm. without looking at what you're doing so you're allowing your brain to just your hand and your eye to work together to imaginatively find this coordination and this synchronicity and it can happen, and it, it can and it can happen in, in such a way that, um, my goodness! And right now, I've been following closely the teachings of a French professor in the 1800s, uh, Horace Lacroix, and he was uh, his Lacroix painted the French Revolution actually mm. while it was going on, um, or like he painted. There's an amazing Lacroix painting um, where all of the the communards at the time, so the French Revolution, you know, like um, the communards were sitting there trying to like figure out, trying to make some sort of deal, and I, there's this like amazing painting, like such detail. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, I we actually have to wrap it up, unfortunately. Uh, so. Learn how to sketch. Take Sergio Garzon's class at the Honolulu Museum of Art mm. School, and you can use the skill in so many ways. Not only to draw little comics to your friends, to you know express your ideas on paper so that you can communicate them more effectively. Um, drawing infographics, which is huge now. Going to conferences, drawing, um, sort of drawing the notes um, for whatever speaker is going. Those are huge now. If you go to San Francisco or LA or like any of the big conferences, there's always a sketcher near there doing that. Um, of course, go on the street, you know, you go in Waikiki, make 200 bucks an hour from what I hear actually, <laughs> which is pretty, pretty good. So that's a key to being um, an artist entrepreneur is basically, you know, learning how to sketch the basics. Um, so thank you so much, Sergio. Um, you're amazing. Thank you. Please look him up online. Go visit oh. his studio um, at the Chinatown Artist Lofts. And we're really looking forward to seeing the um, the rest of Kanaloa and the other gods that you're going to be animating through your print figure series. And I certainly will be there to help and be at your class for sure. I need to work on my sketching. I can kind of do a stick figure. It's pretty good. Uh, maybe you could improve. So uh, thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Lindsay K. Wilbur. I'm the millennial entrepreneur. And please tune in every Friday at 3 p.m. And remember to like Think Tech Hawaii on Facebook. Aloha.